Well, that's some epic walkout music. I feel like I should be Conor McGregor or something, man. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty big. Wow, that was, I didn't expect that. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome, everybody joining us online as well. So if you got your Bibles, we're in the, the book of Hebrews, the letter of Hebrews. Really what I believe is actually a sermon. It's super, super unique. Many people consider this to be one of, if not the most challenging letter in the entire New Testament. Like I said, it's rich, it's deep, it's wide. It's a bit challenging because the author writes from a historical perspective. He reaches into the Old Testament and uses it to explain who Jesus is. So be forewarned, if you're here this morning and you're not familiar with Jesus Christ, you're about to dive into the deep end. There's perhaps no higher Christology, that's what theologians call it, the study of who Jesus is, no higher Christology than what we find in actually the first four verses of this letter. So it, it, it comes to us also in the form of several challenges. Uh, there's a lot of encouragement in this letter, but there are a lot of warnings as well. And here's why. Because the author will not allow us to live complacent lives. He wants you and I to press on in Christian maturity. So I just wanna, I wanna set it up by telling you that if you stay with us over the next nine, 10 weeks as we lead up to Easter, you'll be radically transformed by the words of this book, period. Period. What I have found is that some of the more difficult things to understand are some of the larger nuggets of spiritual growth. And time and time again, you're gonna read things that are kinda of like, oh, that is just kinda of pressing in on me. Making me feel a little uncomfortable. Excellent. There is no growth without a little bit of personal adversity. I don't know about you, but I need changing. I need to be changed. So don't be surprised as we work our way through this if every once in a while you get this impression that God is speaking to you in a unique way. That's the power of this letter. Let me give you a little background beginning with the author. Who wrote it? Not sure. How's that? Some people think that the Apostle Paul wrote it because there's mention of his younger protege, a man that he discipled, a younger guy named Timothy. But the language, the grammar doesn't quite fit what we know about the Apostle Paul and his writing style. So there's a question mark there. Some people think it was written by this man named Apollos. Apollos was very educated. The Greek, the grammar is sophisticated, it's fluid. It appears that Apollo studied in Alexandria. That was the major center for Greek learning. All the best universities were in Alexandria. That's where Apollo was from. And he was known as a great communicator, a great orator as well. He also had a firm understanding of the Old Testament. And so if you think of the book of Hebrews as a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or better, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, Apollos would have known that very well. But we just don't know for certain. That's why for the next few weeks you're gonna hear me use the phrase, the author says this, the author tells us that because we just don't know exactly. Now let's talk about the audience. Because it has a heavy appeal to the Old Testament, it's clear that the audience is made up of Jews who embrace Jesus as the Messiah. See, if you read the Old Testament, you get all these crazy prophecies. And I mean crazy. The specificity of the things said hundreds of years ago fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ regarding his ministry, his death, his burial, and resurrection. There's nothing like the Bible. And so these Jews recognize that and they come to embrace Jesus as Yeshua, as the Messiah. Deep Old Testament overtones. So why does he write? He writes because they were struggling. They were struggling to leave their old ways behind. All they ever known, Old Testament, Old Covenant, listening to the voice of the prophets and the great patriarchs. And, and the, the challenge was for them to fall back on, on what was familiar to them. But the author writes and he says, <clears throat> Jesus is so much better. Jesus is supreme. You can't get any loftier than Jesus Christ. 
So don't be tempted to fall back on what you know. Some were being tempted to form this sort of syncretism, a blending of Judaism and Christianity. So again, the author presses in, he says, you gotta understand something. What Jesus did on your behalf is so much better than what you currently subscribe to. Don't, don't go back to what you're familiar with. Press on, follow Jesus, know Jesus, understand who Jesus is. I'll give you a modern day example of this. A few years ago, I was with some friends and we were serving some of the poor villages that surround Antigua, Guatemala. While we were there, my friend who was also our host, he lives in Guatemala City, he said, I want to take you into the Catholic Church. So we went to the Catholic Church there in Antigua. And as, as we walked inside, immediately I, I, I realized there's something weird going on in this church. I look over and there's this, this peculiar looking man. He's squatting over this little table. He's got a bunch of candles on it, man, like maybe 20 or 30 candles. They're small. They look like birthday candles. They're all lit. He's got this silk bandana on his head, tied in a knot down, down low on his back. And he's wearing shorts and like a tank top. And he's it's, it's just looking and he's kind of rocking back and forth. And I said to my friend, what is that guy doing? My friend said, I think I know, but I'll find out. So he walks over, they engage in a conversation, they're speaking to each other in Spanish. My friend walks back over after a couple of minutes, and he says, yeah, it is what I think it is. See, that's the local witch doctor. And he's there performing a ceremony on behalf of two single ladies who want to be married. And so their, their hope is that as they pay him to perform this ritual, this ceremony, that that will bring them husbands. And I said, you got to be kidding me, inside a Catholic church. <laughs> and, and he said, yeah, because here's what, what happened. The indigenous people have a really hard time letting go of their spiritism and their animism, and so they blend it with Catholicism, and it forms a syncretism. That's a lot of isms, I know. And I said, but that, that's what it is. Yeah, they kind of turn a blind eye to it, because otherwise, if they tried to trunk off, truncate, you know, if they tried to separate them from what they were familiar with, it would just, they would never be part of the Catholic Church. Now, granted, this is a very small group, but it's alive and, and well. And so, see, for, for these first century believers, it's like they knew their Judaism, they had their Old Testament, their sacrificial system, they had the voice of the prophets, they had their Old Testament, and now they're introduced to Jesus as the Messiah. And they're really, it's a little, they're trying to figure out how do we figure, I had, after the first service, I had this lady come up to me, she's a Jewish believer, and she said, it's still to this day, it's kind of a challenge for me to find my place in Christianity. Because I'm familiar with the old. But now that the new has come, it's a little bit of a challenge for me. So this is exactly where these people are at. Additionally, we know that these people were city folk. They were living in the big city. And because of that, the anti-Christian sentiment in their time was growing. In fact, in chapter 10, check this out. Imagine this. In imagine, imagine, well, the author writes and he says, some of you are gladly accepting the plundering of your property. You are sympathetic to your brothers and sisters that are in prison. See, what was happening is some of these people were, were, some were, were questioning, some were struggling, but some were like, oh no, we're all in. <laughs> we're all in. And the life to come is so real to us and the kingdom of God is so real to us that the things of this earth become very, very small. You gladly accept the plundering of your property. <sighs> How do you get to that point? It's because you have a very high view of who Jesus is and what he did for you. So all throughout this letter, you're going to see the author press in and say, don't forget who Jesus is. The new is far superior to the old. Now, there's one other, one other question that these people were asking. And this is a good one. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you haven't asked this question, then maybe you're not being totally honest. You ready? If God loves us, why is life so hard? That's a fair question. You ever, you ever think about that? You ever ask yourself that question? 
so many challenges in life, like we've, we've been saying over the last few weeks, life just has a way of stripping things from you. Life just has a way of taking things away from you. Why is life, if God loves us, why is life so hard? Even for his people. The answer is this. Life is a journey from alienation to acceptance. Life is a journey from being separated from God to being in the presence of God. Life is a journey from weariness to rest. Not just physical rest. What I'm talking about now is the kind of rest that your soul longs for. Life is a journey from weariness to rest. So all this as background sets us up to the timing. When was it written? I think it was written sometime before AD 70 because in AD 70 it gets really bad. The temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. If that w had already happened, I would think that the author would make mention of it because Jewish life would be turned completely and totally upside down, but there's no mention of it. So I think it's written before AD 70. The big point, big picture is this. Jesus is far superior to anyone or anything. And you see that in almost every, every chapter. Let me give you a quick overview. Chapter one is all about the superiority of Jesus over the angels and the prophets, which is big because back in the day, they believed that it went from God to the angels to everybody else. Sometimes God to angels to prophets to others. So they had a super lofty view of angels, super high view of the prophets, right? Because they were the ones that, that communicated on God's behalf. And the author's like, no, 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 no. Jesus is far superior to them. Chapter one, chapter two, Jesus is, better, is a better savior. He had the Old Testament, the sacrificial system. Jesus is way better than that. Verse three, Jesus is greater than Moses. That great patriarch that gave us the, the commands of God, yeah, Jesus is way better. Chapter four, the believers will find a better rest in Jesus. Chapter five, Jesus is the best high priest, better than all before. Hebrews six, there's a warning against falling away from the faith. Chapter seven, there's this, this great priest, Melchizedek. Melchizedek, author says Jesus is better than him. Chapter eight, Jesus is a, a, brings a better covenant. Chapter nine, Jesus brings something new and better than the old system. Chapter 10, Jesus is a much better sacrifice. Hebrews 11, you get this hall of faith hame, fame, faith hall of fame for those that have placed their faith and trust in God, looking forward to a savior. Hebrews chapter 12, Jesus is our, is our example. Hebrews chapter 13, Jesus never changes. So you can tell all throughout the book there's just massive spotlight and the author just holds it squarely on Jesus. No higher view of Jesus than what you'll find in the first four verses. Here we go. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. He's laying it out there. Reaching back to the Old Testament. When God spoke to us, he spoke to us through people like Ezekiel, Daniel, Abraham, Isaac, great patriarchs, great patriarchs. We all know that. You pick up your Old Testament and read it. That's how God, when God wants to speak to his people, he used these individuals. That's how he spoke in the past. Ah, but in verse 2, he's doing something different. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. No other prophet, no angel is counted as an heir of all things. Jesus is better. Through whom also Jesus created the world. There isn't any prophet or angel that that can be said of. Verse 3, more so, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by a word. That's how powerful he is. After making purification for sins, that's why he came, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You may know that to sit at a person's right hand side, the king's right hand side, that was a place of honor and privilege. So there's a seat next to God that says reserved Jesus. Having become as much superior, far more superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The word angel means messenger. Jesus means savior. The title that Jesus has, Son of God. No one else has that title. Jesus is supreme. This is not a typical introduction. That's why I think this is actually a sermon that was meant to be preached with fire and passion. Because typically in a letter, you introduce yourself, that's what we see in Paul's letters, 
the time Paul, a prophet, and grace and peace, all this time. And then he goes into what he wants to say. But here it's like, the author's just like, he's like melts your face from the very first line. What he tells us is that God has spoken to us in a new way through his son, Jesus. So in the past, it was like the prophets would give little bits of information and you could begin to kind of piece things together. In fact, the word many ways is one Greek word and it's, and, and it's polytropos and it literally means pieces, many pieces. God was speaking and he spoke to Daniel and there were some little pieces. He spoke to Isaiah and he gave him some little pieces and all these little pieces were out there. But now God is communicating in an extraordinary way. And what he's doing is he's communicating through a family member. So here's the deal. If I want to get to know the real you, who am I going to talk to? I'm going to talk to your spouse and I'm going to talk to your kids. And if they're honest with me, they're going to tell me exactly who you are. See, there are conversations that are had around the dinner table at my house that only family is privy to. So if you really want to know me, you're going to talk to my kids. Talk to my wife. And when they're honest and candid, they'll tell you exactly who I am. So isn't it interesting? The author says, let me just tell you how much better Jesus is. See, before you had these prophets or you had these angels, but now you're getting someone who sat at the table. You're, you're hearing from a family member. It's so much better. He has a very special privilege in place. He has full knowledge of everything. He has something that no prophet can claim. He's an heir. An heir is one who will inherit something from another. Additionally, remarkably, says that Jesus was there in the beginning of creation and was involved in creation. So this is the first time that Jesus is mentioned like this. In John chapter 1, verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. Jesus, the self-existence of Jesus began before his birth. You see this over and over throughout the Bible. James Moffat puts it well when he says this. What the son was to possess as an heir, he was actually instrumental in making. There's this really interesting conversation that goes down between Jesus and some of his followers in Luke chapter 10. He sends the men out and he says, you're going to go out, you're going to cast out demons, you're going to be doing all kinds of crazy supernatural stuff in my name. So he sends the guys out and they're like, whoa, it's working. And they say to Jesus, the demons submit to your name. And then Jesus says something like, he just like, takes the conversation in a completely different direction. You'd think he'd be like, I know, isn't that awesome? I mean, I got some power, you know, watch, you want to see me flex, you know? He says this, I saw Satan fall from the sky like lightning. Excuse me? What a bizarre response. Brilliant. Because he's just taking their minds and just, he's like, you think that's cool? Let me just, let me just crack the old my a little bit broad. He says, yeah, I was there before the creation of Adam and Eve when this showdown happened between God and Satan. Satan tried to usurp God's authority and the created thing doesn't tell the creator how it goes and so God cast him out of his presence. I saw that happen. And so now the guys are like, Jesus is always present. Just, here's the thing. You have domesticated Jesus. Don't do that. You understand what I mean by that? You've domesticated Jesus. It says, he is an heir. He is the, it was involved in the creation of the world. What he is to possess as an heir, he was actually instrumental in making. So God is now speaking to us in a new way. It's also better. Also, it's the best possible way of ruling us. Here's the, here's the big question. Big question everyone knows. Hey, what is God like? There's some really funny, kind of sad in a way, in entertaining YouTube videos when people are asked the question, what is God like? And people are just like, Whoa. He, Jesus, verse three, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Okay, so this is a big deal. To radiate something is to reflect it. So you, when you look in a mirror, it reflects your image, reveals who you are. Now this is where the language gets really cool. The words exact imprint, let me give you the pronunciation of the Greek word translated into English as exact imprint. Let me give you the Greek pronunciation. You ready for it? Character. That's the Greek word. That's how you pronounce it. Character. So you read the text that way. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is the character of God. 
In other words, you want to know what God is like? What's God's character like? Look at Jesus. You can't know God without knowing Jesus. He is the exact imprint. The word character was used by the ancient Greeks to describe the process of making coins. A stamp would be pressed into the metal. And whatever was on that stamp, that metal would pick up the imprint. It was the exact imprint. You can't know God without knowing Jesus. If the question is, what is God like? The answer is Jesus. This is why at one point, Jesus is having a conversation with this guy named Philip. And do you ever get exasperated with people sometimes? Do you ever get frustrated with people and you're just like, oh, I can't believe you're not getting it yet. Okay, I think Jesus understands. So this guy named Philip in John chapter 14. And, and Philip has been hanging out with Jesus for a while. And he comes to him and he says, hey, Jesus, just do one thing and it will be enough. Just one thing. Show us God. Show us what God is like. And here's Jesus' response. And I, am, I, I'm, I just have this feeling that with a little exasperation in his voice, a little frustration, Jesus is like, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Philip, we've been together. You've seen me. You've seen me offer people forgiveness of sins. Only God forgives sins. When I forgive people of their sins, I'm claiming the work and the act of God. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The prophets would always begin by speaking like this. The Lord says, and the people would be like, oh, oh, God is speaking to us through you? Okay, we better listen. You know Jesus never says that? Not once does Jesus ever say, the Lord says. What he does is this, I say. He says, I say to you. So what he's doing is he's saying there's no higher authority. I am the highest authority, revealing the character, nature, and power of God. So he's doing something new. He's doing something better, God is. But he's also doing something in a final way because you won't find anything in the Bible loftier than Jesus. So the author wants us to know that Jesus is so much better than the angels, better than the prophets. Why would you ever turn back to the ritualistic ceremonial ways? Jesus has superseded them all. Not only this, but Jesus has the very power of God. He upholds the universe by the word of his power, or more literally, the power of his word. So I got really curious about this a while back, and uh, uh, I, I read that, certainly many of you will know more about this than me, I read that scientists are not certain on what holds the atom together but they refer to it as the strong force, and there are a lot more questions than answers. Now what's interesting when you read the Bible, when the Greeks wanted to describe everything, they used the word panta, and that's the word that's used here in this text. Jesus holds panta, he holds everything together. So not just the world, the universe, everything. He holds it all together, and how does he do so? By the power of his word. Isn't that interesting? We don't totally know what holds everything together. We haven't really found the answer to that. And you read the Bible and it tells you it's actually Jesus and his power. And by the way, he doesn't have to lift a finger to do this. Isn't this interesting? He doesn't have to lift a finger to hold everything together. He simply speaks and things are held together. I heard it put this way and it really kind of blew my mind, impacted me. If the distance from the earth to the sun is 92 million miles, and that distance was re re represented by the thickness of a piece of paper. Then the distance from the earth to the nearest star beyond would be a stack of papers 70 feet high. Each piece of paper represents 92 million miles. Stack of paper 70 feet high representing the distance from our planet to the next nearest star. The diameter of our galaxy would be a stack of papers 310 miles high and our galaxy is just one little speck, a little tiny little speck in the universe. So if there is a supreme being out there and he holds everything together with the power of his word, question for you. Is this someone who comes into your life as an advisor or a consultant? 
Is this someone who enters your life and says, I'm here to be your personal assistant. What can I do for you? So you've domesticated Jesus. And that might be the reason why your faith is actually small. Oh. He's so much bigger than... See, this is when the guys come back and they're so pumped up about having this power over demons. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't put me in a box now. I'm actually bigger than you think. I'm actually more powerful than you think. I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. So, again, the author of Hebrews, and we're, we're only three, three or four verses into this. He, he just won't allow you to think of Jesus as the simple teacher who lived 2,000 years ago. If you think God is nothing more than this person who kind of lives in your kitchen and takes your orders and prepares things just the way you like them, then you say, well, what's wrong with that? There's no real relationship in that because you need to be changed. And by the way, good luck finding a spouse like that. No, this is the kind of person that you bow the knee to and you give total surrender. Because more than this, he's communicating in a personal way. He's communicating love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. See, that's the motivation, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And the beautiful thing about God's love is that he loves you even when you're a jerk. When I'm at my worst, when I'm so full of dysfunction, because the very next verse, John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's an act of love. Earlier I mentioned that the Greek word for exact imprint is character. That word was also used to describe the impression that a signet ring made on wax. But in order for that impression to be left, something has to happen to the wax first. What is it? Yeah, it's gotta be softened. Where's your heart at this morning? <laughs> Does it maybe need just a little bit of softening to who Jesus actually is? Maybe your view of Jesus has been so small. And the author of Hebrews in just four, four verses, just a couple sentences, a couple Greek sentences, he's just kind of going, nope, not gonna allow you to think of Jesus as something so small. The supreme expression of God, all powerful, no one greater, Jesus is supreme. And he became a servant by dying on the cross for you. So isn't it amazing, you know, Jesus is so brilliant. Of all the things he could have said, hey, I'm about to leave this planet, so remember the time I walked on water? Don't forget, I can do that now. Remember the time I turned water into wine? That was pretty awesome. No, he doesn't refer to any of that stuff. He says, remember my death. Because that's the softening agent. That you had this need that only I could meet and it was gonna cost me everything. That's the softening agent. So not only do you have the ruler and maker and the one that holds everything together, but you have him coming so personal and so committed to you and your well-being. There's nothing like Christianity. There is nothing like Christianity. Nothing comes close to it because Jesus is supreme. So we're gonna do what Jesus commands us to do and that is to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. So let's go to him in prayer. Father, it's gonna get deep and meaningful and Lord, through this this Holy Spirit inspired word, we're gonna be transformed and changed. And Father, now we wanna remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, ultimately expressing his power, the power, power over death that will be extended to those who believe in him. So Father, I pray for every single person in the room, no matter where they're at, they may be near, they may be far, I pray that your spirit would begin drawing and speaking, revealing the thoughts, the intentions, what's really going on inside of us and that we would see Jesus for who he is. The master of the universe who became humble enough to die for us on the cross because he loves us that much. Father, remove any barriers that might between, be between us and you even now. Anything we need to confess to get it out there to agree with you so that we can properly acknowledge 
the rightful place of Jesus in our lives. We pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.